Thank you, Claudia. So everybody's refueled and awake and ready to go. Um, so this, our talk uh, will be a little bit different in that it's going to focus on critical care medicine and uh, um, integrative therapies in a, in a trauma setting. Um, and John Reed will be doing most of the talking here, so I'm just going to really set the stage for him. And just to give you a little bit of context, uh, this is, you know, the, I don't know if you ever see the commercial, you know, don't leave, the American Express card, don't leave home without it. So this is, you know, our university one, um, tells a little bit about our center, that we have been a uh, big focus on research over the years, the National Institutes of Health uh, Center of Excellence for about 15 years. Uh, we're an organized research center, so we collaborate and research with both the basic science, clinical departments, um, around our university and, and other universities. Uh, very active in the Cochrane Collaborations complementary medicine field that we, uh, with Klaus Lind and Andrew Vickers, started uh, almost 20 years ago uh, now, and have been doing outpatient um, clinical care for over 20 years uh, at the university and inpatient uh, care for about the past 10 years with many uh, different departments. Um, and then finally, teaching of medical students, nursing student residents, and other health professionals in the seven professional schools at our university. And then lastly, this community outreach gets more and more important for us, because um, our ultimate goal is to create a, a shift in a culture of health, and then hopefully the idea that becomes eventually an epidemic of health. And so as some of you know, Jonas Salk, talked many years about, ago about this and that epidemics happen in communities. And so through different activities like diet, stress management, and then um, the environment, we are trying to make that, that shift. So how did we really get into uh, critical care medicine? About eight years ago, um, we had these meetings that the dean has every uh, month at seven o'clock in the morning, not my favorite time. And I'm sitting there on my phone, and the fellow next to me is Tom Scalia, who is the head of the Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland, which is one of the top trauma centers um, in the United States. And, you know, he said, you know, leans over and says, you know, Brian, what do you have for people who have severe trauma and they go into a hyperinflammatory state? And I said, well, why? Because, well, those are usually the ones, if we can't do things with our methods, those are the ones that go into septic shock and die. And I said, well, Tom, you know, we, uh, we deal with health promotion, prevention, chronic disease. I'm not sure about people getting off the helicopter and, and um, seeing what we can do, but we, we started and we said we do have, for 20 years now, a holistic approach to pain management. And so he said, that, that's good enough, you know, uh, why don't we try? And so we started with acupuncture and that led to uh, an eight-year engagement now that just keeps flourishing. And so I'm going turn it over to John and he'll tell you the, uh, the rest of the story about what happens there. Thank you, Brian and Claudia. And it's really a pleasure to be here and have this kind of wonderful interchange with everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about the Trauma Center and the context of us developing an integrative protocol. As Brian said, We've had uh, nursing staff doing different integrative modalities for a number of years. And over the past two years, we tried to think through what it would mean to embed an integrative protocol in the regular care of trauma patients. And so what I want to uh, start with is what happened here at the Shock Trauma Center. This was, it's named after Dr. R. Adams Colley, who was an early researcher in the effects of trauma. And uh, he, back in 1968, said, you know, with severe trauma, there's about an hour that you have before you need to do something before the likelihood of survival goes down dramatically. If you don't intervene in people with uh, injury trauma or septic trauma or septic shock. And that led to a whole development of a hospital devoted to trauma care as well as in Maryland, what is probably the most advanced trauma care system anywhere in the world except Israel, where uh, every jurisdiction, uh, the emergency medical people follow the same protocols. And there's a triage between 
uh, local emergency rooms, regional trauma centers, and the shock trauma center. And the state provides the helicopter re, uh, travel for the distant patients. Uh, so that the, the flight times are there, so within an hour somebody can get from their referral hospital to the shock trauma center. The center was originally built in 1988 and was anticipated to have about 3,500 admissions a year. Uh, by 2009, they had over doubled that. Uh, just last year, they opened an additional uh, center and we're probably running between um, eight and 9,000 uh, uh, visits a year now, admissions a year in the trauma center. So when we think about what happens with traumatic injury, all of the work that's been done uh, in both civilian and military uh, in the past 10, 15 years has dramatically reduced the mortality rates from trauma. Traumatic injury causes 9% of the deaths around the world, 12% of disease burden. We have lots of ER visits, lots of hospitalizations. But when we look at what happens to people after trauma, we call it there's a trauma spectrum response. There's a series of different things that can happen. Get headache, substance abuse being uh, 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 chronic use of opioids, people with chronic pain, people with poor bodily function, people with cognitive dysfunction and emotional dysfunction. And the data are pretty um, sobering in terms of morbidity rates. So after coming to a trauma center and recovering, there's a prevalence between 10 and 30% for post-traumatic stress and between 6 and 42% for depression after discharge. And at 12 months, only about 18% of people have a normal quality of life. And 20% of survivors are still experiencing one of the spectrum of uh, responses five years after their injury. So if we want to think about having an effect on long-term response to trauma, if we have an opportunity to intervene early, is there something that has a chance to change that curve? Now I'll talk a little bit about our service. Um, on the integrative service at our hospital, if you look at between the shock trauma center, which is the largest uh, proportion there, the surgical ICUs, the medical ICU, and the pediatric neonatal ICU, over half of our patients are referred from intensive care units. All of our patients are referred by the clinical service uh, physicians or nurse practitioners on the service. And an example of our active caseload, this is how long somebody stays on our service once we get a referral. If you'll see, over half the patients are only on our service less than five days. They're typically discharged. When people come to the trauma center, they're stabilized, and as soon as they no longer need intensive level of care, they're stepped down to another level of care elsewhere in the hospital, or they're shipped to a rehab hospital, or they're shipped home. Um, and if you look, we do have some long-term census patients, um, but if we thought about how we're going to intervene with trauma patients, we're trying to deal with people that are there for either less than five days or up to 10 days. And you'll see when we figured out our trauma protocol, we actually want to try to see people four times during their admission. So we'll talk a little bit about why we picked four times. Um, but basically, the average days on our service are about seven. So everything we do, we're doing in a short-term period of time. And this is obviously different than many of the outpatient integrative medicine services. We're dealing with people with chronic illness that's already established, and you're trying to do symptom alleviation or lifestyle improvement. So who's on our team? Um, most of the team, uh, people that are in purple here, are supported by the nursing department of the hospital. Uh, I, as the faculty member, is supported through the medical school. Uh, we have uh, 
nurses, RNs. We have a technician that does mind-body therapy, and we have two therapeutic musicians. Um, during the uh, two years, the last two years, we had, in addition to the uh, people supported by the hospital, we had a half-time therapeutic musician that was doing a research project on the cancer ward. And I'll talk a little bit about therapeutic music as opposed to music therapy, for those of you uh, the, the distinction might not be clear. So when we ask, now, is there any evidence that if you work with people in the ICU that it's going to make any difference over the long term? And when I did a search for our grant proposal, there was one study from Italy that, sh that was a historical cohort study. So they had followed people before they instituted six visits of psychological support for critically ill patients. What was interesting in the paper, they didn't actually say what they did. They just said psychological support. And I hope that you'll see when I talk about our protocols what we mean by psychological support, how the integrative modalities provide that, and how we do it, or why we do what we do. But basically, they, they followed these people for 12 months and showed less psychiatric medications, less risk factors for people post-traumatic stress. Well, at least that's hopeful, all right? It's a starting point, and it's something that we want to keep in mind in terms of what would we follow over time if we wanted to track our interventions. So what we talk about here, we talk about a golden moment. So we, get, we take off, you know, the golden hour was saving the person's life. The golden moment is, can they become active participants in their healing and recovery? Can the patient feel that their mind and body and spirit and soul kind of are all working together? And there's some kind of empowerment. Now, you've heard this from the other speakers. We're all interested in empowering patients, helping self-efficacy. So now, how do you do this in trauma situations? Well, there isn't any good randomized controlled studies, but a bunch of very wise psychiatry people got together and thought, with all these traumas in the world, the tsunamis and the refugee crisis and, and genocide things and all, what do you need to think about in the population when people have acute life traumas? So expert consensus is five things that you need to do. You need to promote a sense of safety. You have to feel personally safe if you've been traumatized. You have to provide some kind of experience of being calm and your anxiety coming down. You have to promote some kind of sense of self-efficacy or at least group efficacy, like your family can do something or your community can do something or you can do something. There has to be a sense of connectedness from, uh, to other people. You, you don't want to experience yourself in isolation. And there has to be a sense of hope. So we're thinking whatever we do, with people that are coming in with trauma, we need to address those elements in what we do. Now, the other thing to think about, and this is something from first the psychiatry literature, but also the rehab literature, is how is it that the therapist, the practitioner, and the patients interact? Because we all believe, I think, that integrative care is a relationship-based medicine. So, what we want to look about is what it takes to create a therapeutic alliance. How, do, how does the therapist or the therapy team and the patient create a bond? And it has to be an affective bond, something that involves caring, liking, and trust. And you also want an agreement on goals. What are we trying to accomplish here? And then there's particular tasks that both the therapist or the therapist team and the client need to agree upon. Now, there's a lot of research on therapeutic alliances, and this, all the studies said, well, there has to be some kind of rapport, trust, good communication, success in accomplishing things, agreement on what you want to do, and a patient-centered interaction style. There has to be some kind of emotional support, and you have to allow patient involvement. And in the rehab literature, it looked like it typically takes about four visits, four face-to-face -face interactions to develop this kind of alliance. Maybe you can do it on one, but typically you want to have four visits in order to have a good chance of getting 
to having a therapeutic alliance. So when we took what we had learned over the past uh, nine to 10 years and put it in a context of what do we want to do for trauma intervention, this was our trauma care protocol. We came up with four visits. And on the first visit, we want to have an intake interview. We want to hear the person's story. We want to teach them breath relaxation. Now, why do we want to do this? This established, helped establish sense of trust and sense of safety. And we want to start their self-efficacy training by giving them something they can do. Second day, we did live therapeutic music. The patient doesn't have to do much of anything. They just listen. But this provides a passive relaxation experience. Lower their anxiety, a sense of safety. Third visit, we gave people the choice of ear acupuncture or acupressure. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those when we get, get to the techniques involved there. This gives a little patient choice, because some people don't like the idea of needles in their ear. Give an immediate sense of pain relief and reinforce an expectation of a positive outcome. And then in the fourth visit, we did interactive guided imagery. So we were coaching them for an individual self-care practice. And then we left resource materials so they could continue that after discharge. So let me go through the different components of this and why we do each thing. <coughs> the first thing is the importance of storytelling. Now, we're going to go into sort of a philosophical approach here. Um, but Hannah Arendt wrote, being seen or heard by others is reality to people, how, how you appear. So the passions of your heart, the thoughts of your mind, have a shadow of existence until, they, until they're transformed into a public shape, such as what happens in storytelling. Now, what do we mean by that? I have a, a little passage from a book written by one of my acupuncture colleagues from a patient after her interview in an integrative practice. She said, when I got here somehow, I knew this was the right place. I had already been to the University Medical Center in the US, not here, obviously. Uh, and they made me feel like I was just a lamb to the slaughter. I felt you perceived the whole of me. You saw the many symptoms making sense. In fact, you elicited some of those things from me, not just tolerated my tale. I knew on an intuitive level that working with you, treating me with acupuncture, might be of great value to me. So that storytelling, the interaction, brought a sense of positive hope to the patient in the nature of the interaction. So let's talk a little bit about what typically happens in biomedicine. The typical biomedical discourse is called transmissive discourse. It means that the expert is trying to get information transmitted from the subject. And it's important to quickly get the subject's information. Now, especially in a trauma center, this is critical. That's what keeps people alive. You've got to get the information out very quickly so that you make the right interaction so people don't go downhill. So most of the interactions that our patients get in the trauma center are all transmissive. So what we're interested in is the biopsychosocial discourse, a dialogue type of, of discourse. You want to allow the patient and the provider to have a two-way partnership discourse so you can elicit unexpected strengths, beliefs, the inner resources of the patient that then become real and life-affirming because they're telling it and you're hearing it. And that empowers their commitment to recovery. And I'll try to give you some examples from patients. So how do we do this? Well, there's, you know, you use evocative questions. What was that like for you? What do you think is going on? What else is going on in your life at the time that this happened? What's the last time you felt really healthy? Tell me about this. What brings you joy, peace, reassurance, or hope? And what's your personal or community or spiritual support system? So let me give you an example of a patient. Um, he was admitted to the University Medical Center in the middle of July in respiratory distress. He had a severe interstitial lung disease. Uh, he was treated, and by mid-August, it was clear that his lungs were failing, and his only option was going to be a lung transplant. The transplant team came to him and said, 
you know, you'll probably have more than two weeks to live, but we could give you a lung transplant, but we, we're not going to be able to do it because you're on too many opioids. The person had been on opioid drugs for chronic pain for 20 years, had bit prednisone because of his lung disease, and had thoracic uh, compression fractures. So this guy is now overwhelmed and terrified. I've got to get off something I've been on for 20 years, uh, and I'm facing passing away. Well, he was on a step-down medical unit. They were monitoring his respiratory status, and the internist on the unit is a is a supporter of in integrative medicine, and he referred him to our team. So we met with the team, listened to his story, created a treatment program for him. Turned out the most effective um, modality for him was acupressure using a method that I will talk to you when we get to the acupressure part. But they also taught him the acupressure point so he could treat himself. They used some mind-body techniques to help uh, under him project forward that going through this transition was going to leave him in a better place going forward, and they uncovered an important set of strength for him. Turned out he used to play basketball when he was young, and that's how he dealt with his anxiety and stress. So we got a little mini basketball hoop and brought it in the room and gave some little balls so he, whenever he was feeling stress, he could dunk baskets. The team went and visited him every day over the two weeks. Sometimes they had to crawl under the bed to get the balls out and give it back to him. But he got off his opioids and uh, was able to get on the transplant list. So he still has a long road ahead, and we're teach we've taught him some self-care things, and we'll work with him uh, after his transplant. So we elicited things, and we offered things. So that's the, the first part of the story is we all listen to their story. The second thing is we're going to teach them how to breathe. And this is basic yogic breath work. They call it pranayama. And uh, the type of breathing that was investigated in this study was called Ujjayi breathing. It involves glottal stops, so you breathe in and you breathe out, like that. Well, they actually did a comparative study. They had people, half the people do the glottal breathing, and half people just breathe slowly. Turned out, it didn't make any difference if you did the glottal resistance. Didn't make any difference. The important thing is when you got your breath down to five or six times a minute, you moved into your parasympathetic mode. You increased the cardiovagal barrel reflex sensitivity. You helped oxygen saturation, lowered your blood pressure, and lowered anxiety. So we teach people to pay attention to their breath, to be mindful of their breath, focus on belly breathing, and start slowing down. That's the first thing we do, besides listening to their story. Next visit, therapeutic music. Now, there's a program in the States called therapeutic music. These musicians go through a, a program that takes about uh, eight or nine long weekends. They're already trained musicians. They develop um, a repertory of music themes, and they improvise with the patient based on the emotional state of the patient. They're not music therapists. Music therapists involves a lot more psychological treatment planning and stuff. This is an on-the-spot interaction with the patient. So they're trained to play live music for, for uh, patient needs. And there's actually studies on live therapeutic music on patients' affect showing that it creates a positive affect. Well, that's what we wanted. But you know every member of our team is involved with storytelling. So here's a story from our therapeutic musician, Matt. Um, he was, he had just finished in the shock trauma center coming out of one patient. He was walking in the hall, and a young man, about 22 years old, had baggy pants and had his baseball cap on backwards and said, hey, guitar guy, come over here, you know? Um, and Matt said, oh, geez, somebody just wants me to entertain them with music. You know, people have entertainment on the hospital video channel. They can get any kind of music they want. And so we, we try to be careful not to be the entertainers. We actually want to be therapists. So at about the same time, Donna, our lead nurse, happened to be on the floor. So they went in, they explained what we do. And the patient was uh, the significant other of this young man. She was in the hospital bed. She had an external fixation on her legs. She had a ma major fracture of her legs. So she had all this hardware on her legs. And they explained the services. And the same patient said, I just want music now. So Donna sort of turned to, to Matt and said, this is probably a one-time visit because a patient doesn't really want to get enrolled in anything we want to do. 
But before Matt started her session, he said, are you having any pain? And the patient said, well, the baby died. Matt said, I'm very sorry, what happened? Turned out in the car accident, the three-year-old girl was in the back seat and died. The patient was hoping to heal fast enough to get out of the hospital and go to the funeral. And she said, right now all I can think of, she's in a better place. So Matt played the music and she fell asleep. The young man stayed awake and was vigilant and eventually the cell phone rang and the session was over. So Matt went to the nurse and said, you know, it would be really helpful to tell us about these things, about patients' situations, because we often get called for these kind of transitions. Um, and reported back to the team, and this was someone we wanted to follow up, the co-worker visited her the next day, and the patient said that during the music, she had a very happy dream of being with her baby that was a consolation. So um, there's some uh, affective bonding that was happening with these kind of interactions when we listen to people's stories and address where they are. So now the acupuncture, acupressure. Ear acupuncture is very helpful. It doesn't involve a lot of time, doesn't involve undressing people, and we have people that are wrapped up and immobilized and have uh, wound vacs on. It's usually a lot easier to treat them, and we typically will use either the uh, French ASP semi-permanent needles or some um, uh, press patch needles. Um, and there's good systematic reviews on auricular acupuncture for the different trauma spectrum responses, pain, depression, and anxiety. Now, we also give people choices because some people have, don't even like the idea of acupuncture, so we say, what about acupressure? Uh, and there's good as systematic reviews on acupressure. Um, the acupressure model that we use is a clinical acupressure protocol that's derived from the Jinshin system of using acupressure for the strange flows. How many of you here are familiar with acupuncture? Okay, so they're called strange flows or curious meridians or extraordinary vessels, and there's a Japanese system um, that <coughs> involves use of these points, and several there are several different practitioner groups that have branched off of that, but it's a whole body acupressure approach that's very standardized. It was developed in the States, this particular protocol, after the 9-11 events in New York where the clinicians were trying to figure out what could quickly help people be calm and feel safe after trauma. It's called the SAVA protocol. So those are the two things we do, and we can teach people how to do that, teach the family members how to do that as well. So what are the ear acupuncture points we use? Um, we use these points as our key points. And part of the um, reasoning here is that when you're dealing with trauma, you're dealing with midbrain circuits that involve the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. This is all involved with post-traumatic stress, and you get hyperactivation of the amygdala, which changes your perception of pain. So um, we want to work with both the midbrain points, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, as well as the anterior cerebral cortex gyrus that involves with pain, as well as these other points which are general stabilizing points for the central nervous system. Now, in addition to these, the, um, there are body points that are mapped on the ear, so we use both the central nervous system points as well as the peripheral points for the ear acupuncture. Next thing we do is guided imagery. So this is the mind-body technique, but we use what we call interactive guided imagery in which we involve the patient's own narrative in the, uh, their healing process. So again, there's good randomized control studies about this. It says more rigorous studies are needed. I think many of the studies have used tapes, which, you know, if the tape takes you to the beach, but you had a traumatic experience at the beach, the tape isn't going to help. So we use the patient's own narrative. And so what did the patients say? Uh, we, as part of preparing for a grant, we uh, both get feedback from patients, but we have a trauma survivors uh, group in town, and we did 
stakeholder meetings to identify what the main problems are and the kind of therapies that people appreciated. So the patient said, I loved all the therapies. They helped take away my pain. Music gave me instant relaxation. Guided imagery took me away to a very peaceful place. The acupuncture had the longest effect on pain by keeping it away for the longest time. So what we're hoping is that we will eventually get funded to be able to do long-term follow-up of these patients. But I want to thank everyone that worked together uh, to make both this presentation and our teamwork possible. Uh, our shock trauma center, the main medical center, our rehab hospital, the Institute for Integrative Health, the Gabriel's Angel Foundation, which supported our uh, keyboard uh, music uh, therapeutic musician, and the National Center for Complementary Integrative Medicine. And I want to thank you for your attention and 